Well, thank you very much. What an honour um, to be here. And, um, and, and what a great set of speakers, especially following Raleigh. So I think it was Julian Tudor Hart, the GP, and he might have been president of this college who came up with the um, delayed prescription. And um, as you are about to see, all professors are not necessarily intelligent. <laughs> so that's me. I am essentially a plumber from Southend who does a bit of moonlighting. Um, as I'll come on to explain. And the title I was given uh, was Disrupting the NHS. Um, so the first thing I need to say is nothing I say today is a new policy announcement coming out of NHS England, <laughs> given the time period we currently find ourselves in. Anything you think that is a new policy announcement is not that. It is a personal opinion of mine that I am enthusiastic about and want to promote. So we're quite clear as we move forward. <laughs> so I thought, before I tell you about how I'm planning and I think uh, generally people are to disrupt the NHS, I thought I'd tell you about, a bit about where I came from and what I do, and this is my brief CV. So I'm an Essex boy, born and bred in the county, and who went to University College London Medical School, and that's where I had the pleasure to meet the lovely Jack Crindler and beat him regularly at squash in the evenings when he wasn't um, working on his first tech venture. Um, and it was during my PhD, so I did my medical just spent 12 years there, in fact, uh, trained in medicine, did my PhD, and then some of my postgrad training. Um, I started my first company, and since then I've done four startups. Personally, raised about five million pounds of private sector funds to drive those forward, um, and that's the first product I took to the market, which was I was a urologist in a uh, clinic setting. Couldn't work out why we couldn't do scopes on people in the clinic setting. Developed essentially a condom um, that would cover scopes, and so you could actually give someone a sterile cystoscopy rather than a decontaminated cystoscopy so no one ever comes into contact with that other than one person. And I thought it was great and I learned an enormous amount of uh, commercial lessons about that. Uh, and then having got a PhD from UCL and, and, and thinking I trained in London, I go to some great and noble academic institution. I went to my first interview to one of our most ancient uh, university cities and I really liked them and they really liked me. And uh, I should have said, when I, um, when I started my first company, it, it's hard. And people have said, how can you get innovation taken up and forward? And you'd think, well, I was working in the NHS, they would help me. And they were no help to me. And you'd think, I'm at one of the best universities in the world. They will help me take my idea forward. And they didn't help me. I went to the banks, I went to the venture capitalists, angel investors. No one would help me take my idea forward. So eventually, as a junior doctor, I either gave up, like lots of people do, or I had to remortgage my house. So I signed the paperwork and £150,000 invested in my first startup. And then I told my wife what I'd done. <laughs> and um, we're still married. And uh, so when I went for my first interview, um, they said to me, we think you're fantastic. You clinically, you fit exactly with what we need in this fantastic center. Um, but we're a bit worried about all this innovation and enterprise that you do. Um, if you're prepared to give that up, we think this is the center for you. And I said, oh, my house is on the line for this. My wife will leave me. So the next job that came up was in Southend-on-Sea. Um, and as an Essex boy, I thought, well, I'll go back. The chief executive put his arm around me and just said, Tony, I love what you do. Come and show us. Come and show us how to be innovative and entrepreneurial. So I started there as a consultant surgeon seven, nearly eight years ago now. And, it was, and I, my academic life was over at that point. Um, and it was two years later I met the Vice-Chancellor of Anglia Ruskin University and um, having turned down one of the most ancient universities on the planet, I became the youngest surgeon in the country to be appointed to a UK university chair and the first chair of medical innovation. They haven't spoken to me at that other ancient university for a long time since. So the Vice-Chancellor said, what are we going to do? How are we going to transform medical innovation? You've done four startups, you've succeeded in spite of the system. Let's see how we can change the world. And I'll come on to tell you a little bit about that. And then in September last year, I was given the great honour by Sir Bruce Keogh of saying, Tony, will you come and work for us part-time at NHS England as our National Clinical Director for Innovation? And you know, that was a, a real great step for them to take and a bold one because I'm someone who sort of fought against the system my whole life. And now they've asked me to come to the centre and try and help change it. So it's a great honour and privilege for me. 
So these are a few quotes that I really love. And, you know, you look at Voltaire, the French writer and philosopher, who knew that if you followed the well-trodden path, you were fine. But if you tried to deviate and through, uh, do something innovative, people were going to hurl things at you. And boy, if you could see the scars on my back, you would see what has happened. I'm just trying to improve patient care. It's unbelievable. And then Woody Allen, several people have said it in different ways. You've got to be allowed to fail. No, I don't. We don't have a journal of negative results or a journal of things that went wrong. Failure, in my view, is when you don't learn from when you got it wrong. So you've got to get it wrong. We have to have a system that allows you to get things wrong, to make mistakes and to tell people about them. And then I get very good at a pot. I just get on and do it. I love what Bridget Brunson says. And I just get good at apologising and, and, and get on and do it. And it causes a lot of trouble sometimes. So we face a couple of real problems in our country. And uh, two key challenges I've been set as the National Clinical Director. One is the variation of, of adoption, excellence in one part of the country, not um, necessarily equally as excellent in others. And the other one is this, which is highlighted by Sir Humphrey Davy standing in front of the Royal Society in 1809, demonstrating incandescence, a great British invention. But it was 1879 that the first commercially available light bulbs came onto the market, and it was Thomas Edison, the American, that did that. And our problem in this country is we are world leading at inventing things and trialling them and testing them to start out with, but on innovating them and commercialising them and bringing them to the rest of the planet, it's done better by others abroad, time and time again. It could have been the computer, the CT scanner, the MRI scanner, the television. You can pick whatever you like. All invented in Britain, but commercialised and innovated abroad. And if we are going to disrupt healthcare and make a change in that, we need to get, bring the benefits of those great inventions that you come up with, and we need to have them here in this country. So I'm a little Essex boy, and I'm in a university that's got a campus in Cambridge and, 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 and one in Essex. And how am I going to set out a vision that I want to change the health care of everyone on the planet? And my view was what we could do is we can create a place, one place you can go to, where someone with an idea can take that and it can be transformed into a, a successful product, service, care pathway on a global scale, then we truly have the opportunity to impact everyone's healthcare on the planet. Now, everyone said it's absolutely impossible. How are you going to create that? Well, we said that out and the vision was it would be, we, I'd have to raise half a billion pounds. Uh, we would build out at least 120 acres of land, 2 million square feet of medical technology science park space, create 12,500 new jobs in our county, um, turn over £1.3 billion, which would take the UK from trade deficit into trade surplus in the med tech sector, and create one of the world's largest health innovation spaces. And I was one day a week at Anglia Ruskin University, and everyone said, it's impossible. You're never going to do it. It cannot be achieved. There's no one like you who's ever done anything like this before. And I said, well, do you know, 150 years ago, there was a boy from Essex who went to University College London Medical School, and he went on to change the health care of every single person on our planet, and his name was Joseph Lister. So you can be a boy from Essex with a dream, and you can go and change the health care of everyone if you want to. So that's our first impossible building, the £6 million pound medical business incubator, which is opened on our Chelmsford campus. 100 other buildings like that are going through the planning process, have been funding and are, are funded and are going up across our county at the moment. So when did we stop dreaming? When did we stop saying, actually, we can do anything if we set our minds to it and bring the right partners together to do it? So at NHS England, when I started there, I learned a few figures which I was pretty stunned at. I knew quite a few things. You know, we turn over over 100 million or so a year. Um, our population in England, about 54 million. We're all living longer. We all know those sorts of things. Um, we've got 1.4 million employees. But key things, every 36 hours, we see another 1 million patients. Wow. And every year, 75 million outpatients and 15 million inpatients. So if there is a place anywhere on the planet where you can innovate at scale, my argument would be the NHS is it, is it. A unified healthcare system. I know it's complex. 
we have some amazing things. We have data sets for our population going back 20, 25 years, an electronic primary care record in our hospital episode statistics. What a great mine of information we have there to start releasing the potential of things like the 100,000 genome project that's going forward at the moment and other things. So other countries who don't have those data sets are going to have to look prospectively at their genomes and the work that's coming out of them. We can screen the genomes and we can look back at what happened to that person 25 years ago and this is where they are on their journey. So disrupting the NHS. So that's me and why I've come to where I've come, how are we going to get on and do that? And there are a number of things that have been announced and a number of things we're going to do. I like this quotation. This was Abraham Lincoln in uh, one of his speeches to Congress in uh, the middle of the American Civil War, and it was a really tough time for the Americans. Um, you know, the NHS was founded in a really tough time for our country. It was 1948, just after the Second World War, and it was a difficult time, and we had lots of problems. And I love it when he says, we can't carry on with the status quo of what went before is not going to be adequate for what we have to face in the future. We need to think new and act new if we are going to save our country in this case. And my view would be we need new thinking and new action. You've seen some of that here today if we are truly going to do something different in healthcare. So do we need to do things better, faster, or smarter, what I would call incremental innovations, or do we need to be what Clayton Christensen at the Harvard Business School says is disruptive innovation? Do we need to make things affordable, accessible, and acceptable to the population? And he gives great examples of uh, uh, how things came in, like in the motor industry, where you had established players, Fords and others, who were delivering a premium product, and Toyota came in disrupting the market with an economy model car that everyone said, well, who will want to buy that? And guess what? A whole new market of people came in to buy that, uh, that new car. And slowly, Toyota then got better, faster and smarter and built up and started to displace Ford from their position where they were. They disrupted the market. So can we be disruptive in healthcare? Currently, we serve a population of people who are unwell, who come to us because they are sick. Well, don't we need a new marketplace? Don't we need to actually enable and democratize the people who are currently well and say, actually, we want to keep you well and we want to keep you well for longer and how are we going to do that? So it's a completely different marketplace. We're always going to need to look after people when they get sick and we have to do it better, faster and smarter and we all see all those things, but we need to get serious about prevention. And that isn't the five year forward view, so I know I'm on message with that. So what are we going to do to make the NHS better? Well, it's all, in my view, it's all about partnerships. And we had an announcement a couple of years ago, they were established, our academic health science network. So if you look at other countries, and you could take Germany, for an example, where they have traditionally brought together their academics, their uh, clinicians, and their industry, and got them to work together and supported them to create one of the greatest medtech economies on the planet, but brought great benefits to the population of the world as well. So our academic health science networks are a stab at us doing that. There are 15 of them across the country, and the, the point is they're meant to be open innovation platforms where everyone can come together. It doesn't matter if you're a doctor or an academic or a patient or a charitable group or a user or whoever you are, and we can talk about what the problems and what the issues are, try and come together to find out what the solutions might be and then put them into place. And so I think if you have a great idea and want to help take it forward, the academic health science networks are a really great place to go to. So we're putting a whole load of other things in place. Many of them are announced and people will know about them. So if you're a small company starting up and you think, I'm never going to be able to get a nice approval. Now, our National Institute of Clinical Excellence is fantastic. And uh, people across the world are starting to use the evidence in their own countries and things. But it takes quite a lot of randomized controlled trials to get to that level and, and establish medical evidence. But what we've introduced is something called MedTech and medical innovation briefing. So you can go with a much lower level of evidence so we can provide a sort of a, this is the NHS's view of the evidence you've been able to provide so, to people who are purchasing in healthcare organisations. You could say, actually, we've got a medical innovation briefing and this is what it says. This product looks okay. There aren't any large trials about it, but it seems reasonable what they're saying. It all sounds fair. And that's been very helpful to lots of companies. We have a number of um, funding options available to us and I'll come and show you some of the people from our SBRI um, call that we've got going on at the moment. 
and various other things. Two new announcements that we've had are our National Innovation Accelerator, which we've just interviewed. We went out to a call to the world and said, tell us what your great, greatest innovations are. We had more than 120 applications from global corporates from across the planet to little startups, and some from the NHS and, 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 and even individual clinicians applied for things. We've now shortlisted them and the final uh, panel next week to sift who these top 20 global innovations we've found are. And what we're going to then do is incubate. We're going to mentor them, we're going to support them, we're going to navigate them through the system and try and help them get their products, services, pathways, whatever it is, taken up across the NHS. So, wow, what a powerful thing that would be at, uh, at getting taken up across the system. And then the next thing is the announcements that have gone out about test beds. There are going to be probably a, between four and six areas of the NHS with populations of around a million people where we want to be the go-to place on the planet for you to come to to test and trial it. There will be some funding to help make that happen. There will be willing clinicians who can at scale across a population test and trial anything. So it's these little steps we're starting to take that are helping us to build the key thing, which is how we're going to truly disrupt the NHS, and it's just a single word, which is culture. And if we can get our culture right, we get at the top of the shop, and the people at the front line get it, but it's sometimes they get lost a bit in the middle. If we can get from the front line to the boardroom, making innovation everyone's business, and that's not the culture at the moment that we face. If you try and do something new, change your way, you just tend to get penalised. And that, I'm not having it. And if you do find that, come and find me. Find me on LinkedIn, connect with me. So the SBRI programme is fantastic. We started this. £20 million from the government is a grant to small companies that go out. Last year, we, gave, we shared that between 46 different companies. One of them here, Cupra, is it here today, Cupra's Health. Um, demonstrating, which is essentially uh, uh, turns a uh, uh, consultant ENT surgeon from uh, Tunbridge Wells, um, came up with the idea of not just converting an iPhone into an otoscope, but actually building the service in around that so that you could, if you were a, a worried mum in the middle of the night about your son's ear, was it red, inflamed, he was hurting it, what was going on, you could get advice 24-7 about that remotely on your phone, whether you were a GP sitting in a surgery not knowing quite what you had in front of you, you could get advice from that as well. And then something which is truly fantastic um, is the Noctura mask. So this is a disruptive innovation in diabetic retinopathy. Some really bright uh, uh, academics, um, I believe they were from Cambridge originally, um, discovered that actually the retina has the, its highest uh, metabolic rate, so when it's turning over the most, is when it's dark. Um, and so at night time, uh, normally in the daytime, we're all fine, even diabetics are fine because it's nice and bright. And at night time, our retinas go down to a level where we just about stay above the ischemic level. If you're diabetic or you've got eye damage, it, it goes into the uh, ischemic level and more damage occurs. And they discover by putting this little mask on you, which flashes lights at your uh, eyes, it um, raises the, uh, uh, reduces the metabolic level rather in your eyes and allows you to um, uh, uh, it prevent uh, potentially damage from ischemic change. And one last slide, sorry, because I see the red light is flashing at me, is. Um, one of the people in this photo is who I think is the global leading surgical innovator of modern times on the planet. And the other guy is someone who's hoping some of that will rub off on him. And if anyone can tell me who the guy on uh, the side with the glasses is, I'm happy to buy you a beer afterwards. Yeah, oh, you, sorry, and you've seen it before. I can recognise your accent. So that's Tom Fogarty, the Stanford surgeon who developed the Fogarty catheter. Surgeons, and he was told it will never happen, it will never work. Surgeons want to cut all the way down your body and your arteries until they find the clot. He said, no, make one cut, put a balloon catheter down it, blow it up, pull it back, and lo and behold, the clot comes out. And he transformed surgery by doing that. Anyway, that's it. Thanks very much for listening.